Well, good morning. And thank you all for your introductions and prayers. I need a little spirit after doing a po podcast with uh, Dr. George. <clears throat> Uh, there's so many things to be grateful for to be here at Beast, and I've heard of it for many years. And uh, uh, it's been such a gracious time to be here. But more specifically, uh, Beeson has bestowed upon our church in uh, Roanoke, uh, St. John Lutheran, our associate pastor, Miles Hickson. And uh, uh, he raves about the Lutheran professors that taught him here at Beeson, and I'm currently teaching a course on Luther with Miles, and he passed the candidacy exam in the North American Lutheran Church with flying colors. And Jerry, I just want to tell you, we got him now, and you may not get him back. <laughs> uh, wonderful young man. So I'm full of gratitude to Beeson for that gift. Uh, but I'm also miffed at Beeson uh, because my friendship with Jerry of 26 years, I hired him, uh, meant that every morning we would meet for a while to solve the problems of the college, the church, and the world. And uh, there was no uh, sign on the horizon that he was going to leave Roanoke College. He had his uh, retirement all figured out uh, where he could write up big projects. And wouldn't you know, the only job that would steal him from Roanoke College was Beeson. The Anglican chair at Beeson, and off he went. Now the collateral damage is that the college and the church and the, and the world have kind of declined <laughs> after uh, those conversations uh, it came to an end. We continue to be very much engaged, but uh, he's having such a good time here, you may never get rid of him. That's the, another thing you have to be worried about. Well. Uh, I've been fascinated by this talk of, of, of religion and politics ever since I read Reinhold Niebuhr's uh, uh, An Interpretation of Christian Ethics back in 1958 as a senior at Midland College. And uh, I generally uh, have written a good deal about religion and society, but religion and politics came to the fore when I experienced a lot of books in the early 2000s that really made me angry and indignant because they were bad ways to think about religion and politics. And uh, one of the symptoms of that bad way was to mistake the separation of church and state in America with the interaction of religion and politics. Uh, the former is very different than the latter. Uh, the former, uh, the uh, prohibition against the establishment of religion, was viewed by many people in the early America as the greatest blessing of God since the close of the New Testament because it set free the church from the control of the state. And they thought that freed the church to evangelize. And so there's still a great blessing coming with from that First Amendment, no establishment and the guarantee of free exercise. Incredibly good gift. But that means this institutional separation of church and state, which we all can accept and, and really celebrate. But from the very beginning, religion and politics were highly, uh, a highly lively connection from the very beginning. So it's a very different kind of thing to talk about the church and state and the interaction of religion and politics. But those two are still used that. Uh, mistaken argument is still used to try to make religion private. That is to uh, push it out of the public sphere and to ban religiously based arguments about morality and politics to the private sphere. And another bad way or thing that made me indignant or angry was that uh, in the secular world of colleges and universities, generally religion was viewed as irrelevant to politics, mainly because the scholars examining that area were secular people themselves, and then thought, since they didn't see any connection between religion and politics, uh, certainly the wider world had no real connection between religion and politics. But in fact, the religious factor is incredibly important in politics in America. So that was another kind of irritation that made me take up the pen to write this book. Uh, and I believe since then, things have become even more pressing to get clear about the proper relationship between religion and politics because there's arisen a very strong atmosphere of uh, what one could call secular progressivism 
that is very hostile to the religiously based arguments in the public sphere and agitation in the public in politics by religious people. Uh, there's a great uh, temptation or pressure from them to, to for religion to remain private, and oftentimes Christians respond to that by self self censoring. They they do not bring up religious arguments and keep it private themselves. So there's a, a strong effort in that area too. Um, just read a review of a, a negative review of the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., where an argue of secular progressive said, the separation of church and state is not just about governance, it's also about architecture and, and um, um, <clears throat> space, that there shouldn't be anything like a museum of, of the Bible in public space in Washington. Now, that's a perfect example of kind of pushing religion out of the public sphere. So anyway, uh, there were a lot of bad ways to think, so I took up the pen, and in the first, second chapter of my book, I talk about separationism. Uh, that's one bad way to think about religion and politics, to separate the interaction of the two. And uh, then the other one was what I call the fus fu fusionists, those who fuse religion, get religion and politics too close together. The other one trying to separate them. And the first one uh, is uh, I call the separationists. And uh, they want to keep politics free of dangerous religion. And this has been exacerbated by uh, a lot of the sexuality issues that have come up, particularly gay marriage debate in the USA. But there's an external pressure to keep religion out of politics, keep dangerous religion out of politics. And uh, I think you've got a, everybody has a handout, perhaps. Good, good, that'll help you follow me. I use an example, one of our professors at Roanoke College who became extremely angry at the pro-life movement making headway politically. And he said in one meeting, uh, uh, I don't care if you Christians believe that this little clump of cells should be protected from inception onward. I don't care if you believe that and you act that way within your churches, but do not press that toward publicly and engage in legislation because that coerces the rest of us who don't believe in that uh, to follow your way, and that's moralizing. And the redoubtable George Will, who's usually on the side of the angels, got very upset by a group of uh, Christian friends, or Christian uh, parents in Pennsylvania who tried to insist that creationism or uh, intelligent design be taught in high schools as well as a kind of evolutionary scheme of things. And he too thought that it was very unseemly for Christians to try to push their convictions in the public sphere. And that was this moralizing. So I think it is important that we be careful not to pick the right issues, right political issues to be active on as Christians. Uh, a couple of times in American history it didn't work out so well. There was Sabbatarianism that was trying to make laws that s Sunday would be re remain holy. Uh, and there was, of course, uh, Prohibition, which tried to wipe out uh, the production of alcohol and public drinking of alcohol. Both of them kind of disasters where we lost big time. <laughs> we, so we shouldn't uh, be trying to push all issues into the public sphere. Be careful about what is moralizing and what isn't. Well, the more hostile uh, against Christianity, and there's quite a coterie among them uh, in the elites today, uh, believe that, uh, like Dawkins, believe that religion is so bad for people that it's uh, akin to child abuse to try to convey your religious traditions onto your, your own kids. And of course, they're hostile toward uh, uh, homeschooling. Uh, and uh, uh, have actually suggested that it ought, ought to be illegal for Christian or religious arguments to be made in the political sphere. Kind of a longing for the French arrangement where you can't have public religion. Religion cannot move into the p sphere of politics. So, uh, as I said, there were a spate of books in the early 20, uh, 2000s that worried about uh, religion and politics, religion expressed uh, in American life, we're likely to get a theocracy. And now that takes a wild imagination to think that <laughs> America could become uh, theocracy. And then the argument uh, by a much more subtle and powerful argument by the tradition of John Rawls, 
whose famous theory of justice is still a dominant way to think about uh, justice in society. And he argued that um, only public reason should enter the public sphere as an argument. And by public reason, he meant the kind of things that people would, could agree upon at the lowest common denominator. And in his original, and in his justice, he talks about the original position where if we didn't know who we were, how we were born, what kind of principles would we adopt? And he argues that uh, that will lead to a kind of a minimalist sense of a lot of rights for non-inference so people can live their lives freely. And then on the positive side, a lot of utilitarian arguments, the greatest good for the greatest number. And that comprehensive schemes that come from religion, more comprehensive schemes of meaning and virtue should be ruled out of the public sphere. So the more, much more sophisticated argument, which argues that all the kinds of, a lot of the things that Christians are interested in aren't, shouldn't be argued publicly because they don't meet that standard of public reason. Well, there's been a lot of criticism about that, uh, and he backed up a little bit, but nevertheless, uh, that's a very popular way of looking, keeping religion separate from political life. And as I said, now that has been enough inroads in the society that the progressive, what we would call the secular progressives, uh, have more or less bought into that hook, line, and sinker. And uh, when I talk about secular progressives, I'm referring to a wonderful study at the University of Virginia uh, Institute for Advanced Cultural Studies in which they uh, analyzed American family life according to four different categories. And the most interesting ones, at least for me in this topic, is the, the faith group. And by faith, by the way, this is James Davison Hunter, an evangelical who uh, arranged these sorts of studies at the University of Virginia. Uh, the faith group is about 20% uh, of the, the population, and uh, they believe that uh, truth in morality and religion comes from transcendent sources, from outside of us. And so they believe that they're in revelation and they believe that the, the Christian life is to follow the will of God that has been revealed. And they're against uh, gay marriage. They, they want their kids socialized deeply and they choose Christian schools if they could, if they could afford them. And they're the intense Christian group, Catholics, Presbyterians, uh, uh, Baptists who, who really believe in the faith and that's the way to, to arrange their own lives, but it's also a platform by which to, to move politically into the world. So uh, you get that group as the one who showed up on the March for Life last week. Hundreds of thousands of people on their own dime come to Washington and they're so motivated that for protection of life at its beginning that they're willing to come We'd spend all that time and energy <clears throat> to, to press for those issues. Well, that's, that's the one side, and of course, uh, that's had a lot of political implications. 81% uh, of evangelicals voted for Trump, and I'm quite sure that 81% didn't think of Trump as a model Christian, <laughs> but they thought of him as one who would make Supreme Court decisions that would protect religious freedom. A very important issue for intense religious people who feel that this uh, secular progressivism has separated religion from public life. The next phase is to attack Christian-related institutions and make them conform to public reason and uh, avoid these comprehensive schemes that Christians believe are meant for the flourishing of human life before God. Uh, so, th but the other group, uh, the other interesting group at about 21, 22 percent are what he calls uh, engaged progressives, or we call secular progressives. And they hardly ever go to church, they don't identify religion with a religious tradition. They, uh, <clears throat> they distrust religion because they believe that the sources and guidance system for our lives are practical, pragmatic grappling with issues. And they raise kids to appreciate diversity and inclusion and non-judgmentalism. But they care about their kids, their marriages are fairly intact, and they have enormous power in America because it's the secular progressives that dominate higher education, they dominate the media, they dominate uh, 
book publishing and entertainment, and uh, uh, all you got to do is watch a Grammy Award, <laughs> and you get uh, uh, this particular uh, contingent of, of American society. And they sharply distrust any claim of revelation and truth coming from outside the human project. And what's fascinating to me is where once what you would call the secular progressives were once the elite who were friendly to religion. From the beginning of the country, uh, the deists, the Washingtons, the Jeffersons, all thought religion was important. And as that went through the strand in American history, it was friendly to religion. It was a, uh, Robert Bellis says there was a, a, a wonderful co coherence of biblical virtue and Republican virtue that shaped the guidance system of America. Now, what was a real revelation to me in that University of Virginia study is that the leadership group, the elite leadership group that was once friendly to religion, mainly from the mainstream Protestant traditions, no longer is connected with them and is hostile toward religion. So that's a great deal of uh, reason why we've got polarization in America. And the faith community goes heavily toward the Republican side the, uh, demo, uh, the uh, engaged progressives to the Democrat side and w with a lot of religious uh, f vigor into political choices and political movements. But at any rate, the, the progressive side wants to, uh, religion to remain private and uh, not to express itself publicly. I can feel that operating heavily at Roanoke College where the faculty slowly turned to the engaged progressives, and Christians are fearful on the faculty of even identifying themselves as Christians or making Christian arguments. One young professor I talked to said, when I get tenure, I will uh, reveal myself as a, prof as a Christian and make a Christian argument in class, but not until I get tenure. And a lot of self-censorship self, uh, goes on. Uh, the president will not talk about religious motivations of the Christian heritage of the college because it's embarrassing and offends the engaged progressives. So you get uh, the one bad way about religion and politics and religion in public from those who believe it ought to be separated and religion ought to remain private within the private lives of people and within the walls of the church. Any expression of religion in politics or in public life generally is forbidden. Now, they really can't win the argument. Uh, actually, this book that I wrote, I got a chance to uh, write a distillation of it in an in a editorial in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I thought I had such a reasonable argument. Uh, and uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer makes, if you write an editorial, you have to put your email address by the editorial. And I had no idea what would happen. When I made this, I thought, rather mild argument, uh, uh, the Atheist Society, based in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, I got in a long, long argument with the head of that, but that, he was at least rational and civil, but you get an avalanche of people who think uh, sep they make the mistake of church and state separation for religion and politics separation, and they thought I was uh, a theocrat in the making by saying that religion could have a public role. So, uh, in this long argument with the atheist guy, I finally got him to admit that we could have an expression of religiously based moral issues in political life because I used the examples that I have listed here. History, Ameri American history is replete with religious groups, basically in voluntary societies and churches, affecting political life. Without the first great awakening, there probably wouldn't have been a revolution. Without the second great awakening, we wouldn't have all these Christian colleges in the country. We wouldn't have had uh, anti-slavery movements. They were the crucial elements in anti-slavery movement, churches and voluntary associations. We wouldn't have had the civil rights engagement in the 60s. We wouldn't have the pro-life changes going on without religious effect. So American history is full of this and it has not been recognized as illegitimate in any way. Secondly, the First Amendment guarantees us free exercise of religion. That certainly means more than the private life. It means your political life. It means your institutional life. 
And I believe even the liberals on the Supreme Court justice are going to finally protect that kind of exercise. I, but I, I'll be a lot more comfortable if strict constructionists <laughs> are, uh, elect, are appointed to the Supreme Court. And finally, serious religion can't remain private. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge and sovereign everywhere and will be obedient to Him in every sphere of life, we can't be passive. We've got to engage it because it's God's world and God's uh, politics and God's, God, this is our country under God and we should uh, be engaged. So on serious religion, the constitutional protection of exercise and its role in American history, I think it's clear that that's a bad way to think of, of uh, rela relating religion and politics. Um, there's another contingent within religion itself that uh, wants to keep religion free of dangerous politics. And of course we know the classic sectarian traditions of Mennonites and other of that tradition, and we have a neo-sectarian in Stanley Hauerwas, a very uh, influential theologian, who argues that uh, a Christian should remain free of politics because politics inevitably lead to coercion, and coercion is always backed up by violence. And so if you believe Stanley Howard's argument, uh, Christians shouldn't be involved in political life. I was once on a panel with him. The question was, can a Christian be a senator? And I said, of course. As a Lutheran, I believe it's an honorable calling. And Stanley quipped. He said, yeah, a, a Christian could be a senator, but it would be a very short time before he was uh, recalled <laughs> because he would be against defense he would be so radical in his, his uh, witness that he wouldn't be a senator very long. So we've got that tradition that's still alive in American church life who, who wants to keep Christians out of political life. And increasingly, there's modern, modern, more modern non-sectarian groups, radical orthodoxy. And conser there are conservative Christ uh, Catholic groups called integralists who are so hostile to what they call liberal society that they just want to shun political life. They think America's too far gone politically. And what the point is, is Christians ought to regroup and build their own counterculture and, and forswear political involvement. Large, sophisticated group. Uh, actually, Rod Dreher was uh, kind of interpreted that with his Benedict option, uh, where he says well, there ought to be a strategic withdrawal, but he means that strategically. He doesn't want to pull, pull out of political engagement. I just finished a course uh, at our church where we played against Rod Dreher and his Benedict Option and Rusty Reno's book, the Re the Resurrecting the Idea of a Christian Society, where you get Reno really arguing for engagement and Dreher for a little softer. But we've got people now who really don't want to, uh, uh, Christians to involved, be involved in, uh, in uh, political life. I mentioned of other kinds of versions of this where Christianity is focused solely on the gospel in the narrow sense of salvation. And I quote in the book a famous 19th century Lutheran who said, the gospel has nothing to do with external life, only addressed to the internal soul and eternal life, and the gospel should have no repercussions in worldly life. So there, there's a gospel reductionism that kind of... Uh, separates it from, from political life, and that's keeping religion free of dangerous politics. But most likely the most powerful way that people don't do it is people are, uh, Christians are not encouraged to connect Sunday with Monday. Uh, political politics are com a completely separate realm from religion, and that's a, just a practical way that religion is kept free of dangerous politics. Well, that's uh, probably too long on uh, on a certain kind of, of separationism. And I argue that really can't hold water if you're serious as a Christian who believe in the sovereignty of God and you believe that one of your vocations is to be a citizen. You want to engage your religiously based moral values in the political process as a citizen. Well, the other kind of uh, bad way is what I call fusionism. And this is the opposite. Instead of trying to keep religion and politics separate, you get them too close. And you... Uh, uh, fused together, uh, religious claims and political claims. Uh, some of the obvious ways are when religion is used cynically by political leaders. We, we know about uh, Hitler, 
boy, with the rise of Nazism, tried to co-opt the Christian churches as part of the Nazi movement. And unfortunately, a large segment of German Lutheranism went with him. And they were German Christians. And they fused Nazism with German to the great embarrassment of the Lutheran tradition to kind of do that fusion. Uh, Stalin, when he got in after murdering thousands of Orthodox priests uh, in order to generate enthusiasm to fight the Nazis, uh, reinstated Orthodoxy. And Stalin became a, an Orthodox Christian in order to, a cynical use of religion. Think of the cynical use of religion in, in Islam where authoritarian leaders use Islam as a way to strengthen their uh, authoritarian rule. And then the insurgents use religion in their effort. So you get a political use of religion. Fusing the two, uh, you get uh, in America even efforts to kind of re use religion. Uh, uh, Trump sometimes tries to uh, convince people he's a, a serious Christian. <laughs> and usually makes a mess of it because he knows he's got a Christian constituency out there and he tries to use uh, his uh, religion rather cynically, I think. Then you've got the, what I call the symbiosis of religion with national or ethnic culture. So if you're a, uh, a Russian, you're Orthodox, uh, if, you're, um, uh, a, if you're an Icelander, you're a Lutheran, and in ethnic cultures and traditions with particularly ethnic memories and histories like blacks in America, uh, there's a kind of a fusion of democratic politics and black people. Uh, Jewish voters with a memory of uh, and a longing for social justice get fused with uh, liberal Jews or fused with social justice. So you get a kind of a fusion and uh, people who break from that fusion are often pub punished severely. So you get black intellectuals who won't follow the fusion of Democratic Party and, and black Americans who, who get uh, sharply, sharply uh, treated and criticized, can hardly be out in public, act lecturing in public because they'll catch so much flack. Uh, so you get you get the uh, state favoring the church and the church sacralizing the state. And this seems to be happening again in Russia. Now, after the horrible experience of being fused with, with the czar, now they're being fused with Putin, trying to get other Christians banned from Russian life. So you get this fusion of uh, religion and politics. More subtle forms of what I call straight line th uh, intentional or straight line thinking, where you make the case that the core Christian values are in a straight line, an unambigu unambiguous line from those core Christian values to a political party or a political option or a political ideology or a political choice. And a uh, famous example of that, uh, Paul Tillich once said, if you're a Christian, you're a socialist. <laughs> straight line drawn. In fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book uh, on defending capitalism was uh, precisely to try to argue that it wasn't such a straight line. So, uh, but they're very easy, very, there's a tendency to draw straight lines from, from core Christian values to, uh, to certain kinds of political arrangements. Uh, Richard Newhouse tended to fuse uh, religion and democracy, uh, probably a little too tight. Uh, and uh, then you got dramatic examples of uh, groups like the National Council of Churches who were so fused with left-wing politics that they've become viewed as just another one of their interest groups and even churches, even liberal churches didn't support them. So the NCC is kind of a vestige of history because it fused too closely what its religious convictions were with its political ramifications. I think it's happening embarrassingly sometimes with evangelicals and Trump. I wince when Jerry Falwell realigns re Liberty University too closely with Trump. Uh, shouldn't do that, <laughs> shouldn't get that closely connected. That's a big mistake. Uh, or you wonder whether Islam uh, can accept religious freedom? What form is Islam going to be able to, or whether the fusion is so close between Islam and a certain kind of politics that it won't be able to accept d democratic values. 
Um, most fusion is done unintentionally, where you get peer groups or groups, loyalty groups who, who unintentionally fuse uh, religious traditions of politics. Mainline Protestant churches at their headquarters almost always align their advocacy efforts with the left wing of the Democratic Party. But if you press them, they'd say, oh no, God is not a Democrat. We, we see some distance, but practically speaking, they fuse a certain kind of religious conviction with uh, their public advocacy. I call that unintentional. Uh, interesting example of in the Southern Baptist Convention, where you had the, the Liberty um, Commission, Freedom and Liberty Commission was headed by Richard Land, and he very closely fused the Southern Baptists with uh, very conservative Republican politics. And Russell Moore, the guy who succeeded him, has intentionally loosened those connections and said that uh, the Southern Baptists have to be critical of conservative politics as well as liberal politics. Well, the, the danger of the whole thing is in this fusion, you secularize the transcendent claims of the gospel. You identify the gospel, which should be universal and should be radical in the sense that, that uh, the gospel applies to all people no matter what side of the political divide they're on. A repentant Christian who is a German Nazi I, I don't mean a, Nazi, a believing Nazi. I, I knew many veterans of the Second World War went on a Fulbright scholarship, and they were wonderful Christian people. And they tragically got bound up in a demonic movement, uh, forced into the army and armed services, and they lived tragic lives. Most of them died. But uh, many of them were very serious Christians, and the gospel applies to them too. So political divisions, gospel should overcome political divisions and uh, uh, should not be identified too closely with any uh, political group. So aligning the church with a political establishment has been a disaster in history, with this fusion. Think of what happened to the Catholic Church after, after the French Revolution. There was hell to pay for the Catholic Church. Even worse was what happened when the Russian Orthodox became fused with the Tsar. The Bolsheviks come in and they crucify hundreds and hundreds of Orthodox priests. So there are horrible examples of that fusion taking place. Uh, but those are practical examples. More, more importantly is that fusion is not as dangerous politically as it is to the Church if you fuse too much. It's, it's a diminution, a secularizing of the gospel uh, in a way that is, does great damage to the Christian tradition. So those are the two ways that I think are bad ways of relating religion and politics. One, the separationists who say there should be no connection, which I don't think holds any water for serious Christians. And in American history, it has not held. And the First Amendment guarantees us this free exercise. Uh, so we're going to have to fight against the, demo, the, the secular progressives who say you ought to keep out of the public sphere. And the other way is to fuse the two, and there are some dangers of that in American life, but not nearly as much as uh, the danger is to religious people who try to get too close to political life. So that's my spiel on the bad ways, and Jerry's going to offer some, uh, a chance for some con con conversation. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, so we've got two students in red with microphones uh, for questions now. Uh, so raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and a student will come over uh, with, with a microphone so all of us can hear your question. Okay, right here, Matt, and then Justin. Hey, can you define how religion and politics the way you see it? Oh, good, good question. Uh, uh, can you define religion and politics? Uh, in the book, I try to talk about organized religious traditions because the lecture tonight, I'm going to talk about how organized religious traditions ought to relate politically to the, to the uh, political sphere. So uh, out, of, out of those organized political traditions, you get individuals who then act politically but I want to talk about religion as a kind of an organized tradition. Uh, who was it? Um, 
McIntyre famously said a tradition, uh, the Christian tradition is a, a biblically based, narr- based on a biblical narrative uh, with its attendant practices, and it's a, a argument about the meaning and values of life that persists over many generations. So that's kind of what I mean by religion. And its products, individual Christians then are free politically, and they act differently than the religious tradition, but there's a concrete, I mean it concretely as a religious tradition. And politics, if you, uh, politics is, is the sector of society which, which legislates the laws and which uh, has the power of coercion for its laws and backed up by violence. So that's what I mean by, by politics. Okay, Justin here had, had his hand up. Uh, first of all, just thank you very much um, for a really thoughtful lecture. Um, I'm afraid that I'm asking a question for that I'm asking for spoilers, but I have to work, so I can't come tonight, so I'm just going to ask it anyway. Um, I kind of find myself stuck in this tension where I read someone like Hauerwas or these, um, like the radical orthodoxy women, and I'm really sympathetic to some of their criticisms. I think particularly where they remind us that the vision of the world that modernity gives us is not necessarily a Christian vision, Mm -hmm. um, or that the narrative that the state gives us is not necessarily the way that we should see the state. Um, but I also agree with you that when they push us away from participation, that that's also not an option for us as believers. Um, so do you have any, I don't know, any pointers or any ways that we can participate without necessarily entangling ourselves in those narratives that we can't buy into as Christians? Or do you even see any way to those criticisms at all? Ways of, uh, of what? I'm sorry. Um, some ways that we can participate without necessarily buying into those narratives. Oh, uh, you mean into political life? Right. Uh, well, I think uh, with some of the warnings that I've been given, <laughs> giving that uh, we should not... Uh, uh, w- one of the, the characteristics of the book is I was trying to write from a Lutheran perspective. <clears throat> and one of the things in Lutheranism is the, uh, the doctrine on the two ways that God reigns in the world the law and the gospel. And this is not a spatial separation. We're we're before God and we're before our fellow human beings. And it's very important, it seems, to to know that uh, uh, Richard Newhouse called first things first things because first things were theological and religious. (laughs) All these other things are secondary and penultimate. So we have to keep in mind that uh, our home is in another place, we're pilgrims on earth, and whatever we do on earth, while it might be extremely important, is not a measure, not ultimate. So on that sense, uh, a good sense of uh, the di- distance that's transcendent meaning of the gospel and our eternal destiny are not finally bound up in politics. So you keep a proper distance from political life um, so uh, that's one thing it seems to me, uh, and then being, uh, being called, it seems to me, to have, be a vigorous participant, even though you know it's not the first things, but it's penultimate things, but have a calling as a citizen. One of the interesting things about the Reformation was that one of the vocations of the Christian was the political one, was the citizen one, and uh, the Reformation in education in Germany of Melanchthon and Luther was to produce educated people who could be good citizens. And boy, that meant that they participate in public life and their, their uh, supporters and contributed to public, public life, not, not uh, public life, not uh, impediments or detractors to public life. So I think those sorts of deep Christian convictions that that we're responsible and we have to engage, but at the same time we know, put it in proper perspective. Now, uh, uh, now I might just add that, that uh, a far better answer is coming tonight. And uh, that's actually the better talk tonight at six o'clock. So, um, Dr. Webster. Well, well, thank you for giving up your friend, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just uh, trumped me, so I'm, I, 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 I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> we have had leading figures in evangelicalism that seem to illustrate both separation and fusion. Yeah. Billy Graham, for example, mm-hmm. who would not speak about the Vietnam War and was very close to Nixon, yeah. 
and you have sort of an illustration of both. Do we still do that? Do we still do that? Yeah, is there still that mix of separation and fusion? Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned, the, some, some evangelicals do get too close to the quarters of power, I think. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing when they do. But there's been, uh, not only was, was uh, Billy Graham too close to Nixon, but on the other side, you get liberal theologians too close to Obama. <laughs> and, and you had that tendency to, to, to get too close. Uh, at the height of the Vietnam War, Stephen Olford, from Calvary Baptist Church in New York City. I remember listening to him give a message on peace. And that what was needed was peace. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind because that was not from the evangelicalism that I was hearing. I was hearing we have to win in Vietnam. And here was an evangelical speaking boldly about the need for peace. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what evangelicals should be doing. And that was kind of a wake up call for me as a young kid mm -hmm. of the need for a different and distinctive voice because of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think one of the uh, dangers that I was talking about before is the natural uh, connection now with serious Christians and the Republican Party because of the pro-life thing and religious freedom thing getting a little bit too close. And of course then the polarization is with the secular progressives and the opposite set of issues. But that, they're secular progressives. I don't worry so much about them as the serious Christians who, who see as top flight issues religious freedom and the protection of nascent life, life at the beginning and the end. Where are they going to go? Uh, but yet they have to stay uh, critical of what happens at the Republican Party uh, and conservative politics. I think that it's important to remain critical. Uh, so I, I appreciate your examples. Um, okay, uh, this young man down here and then Colton back there and then David. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you would like to speak more on John Rawls. Um, as you noted earlier, figures like Adams and Jefferson said that you know, a proper American democracy and republic is built on a virtuous people. And part of Rawls' discussion of the least common denominator has to do with, you know, the consensus of the people. So I'm wondering if there is also a chance to speak, um, to almost agree with Rawls in a sense that so long as there is a foundation of a virtuous people in the republic, as there has been for many years, if the Rawlsian way of doing things has a chance of working, um, maybe in the sense that Reno is talking about mm -hmm. um, people like Richard Niebuhr and Reinhold Niebuhr. So mm -hmm. that's my question. Okay, uh, Rawls is a very influential, in fact, my book on capitalism, I used him as a way of talking about justice, and it's a very compelling argument that he makes. He argues that if we were all in the original position, not knowing how we would show up in history, whether it would be male or female, black or white, uh, bright or not so bright, all of these things that make a difference, we would be in the, uh, the veil of ignorance would fall on those things. We would be in the original position and we would negotiate then what kind of society we would construct, what principles of justice would we construct. And it's basically a Kantian argument. Uh, how, by, because if we're in the original position, we would know that we might show up in a lot of different ways, so we're going to be as fair as we can by uh, constructing the principle of justice. So you begin with fair, fair, um, fair liberty, and we would grant each other liberty in our private lives as long as we didn't harm others. We would grant each other citizenship to, to vote on who wanted to lead us. We would vote that whoever wanted to could, could uh, occupy, uh, run for a political position. Then he had the second principle, was fair equality of opportunity, where he wasn't a quality of results kind of guy, but we should strike down barriers for people to, to reach productive positions. And fair equality meant that those who had bad luck by where they were born should be given preferential treatment to get them the same starting line. And then the maximum principle, the third principle, was for those who are productive and have a lot of affluence, those who don't make it in society, we should have a, a very generous uh, uh, safety net for them. 
So, but here's what the problem was. It's a stripped down version. And where does virtue come from? Where do the, the, the characteristics of, of virtue, of, of compassion, of uh, honesty, of courage, where do those come from? He's got it so skeletal that they don't come f- from anywhere. Uh, and and, and uh, how about the building blocks of society? Marriage and f- natural family? All of those are ruled out. And those are the stuff of society. That's what really makes a, gives society robust strength is the kind of virtue that's built up out of religious traditions and other sorts of traditions. Well, he rules all that out. So I think, don't think it's workable. And just one other reflection. Uh, when I started studying Roanoke College's 175 years history, uh, the, the founding uh, president, a guy called David Biddle, was caught up in the Second Great Awakening. And they were so self-conscious that the, so conscious of the fact that the republic was young and there were chaotic influences in it by the populace that the role of Christian colleges was what I call Christian republicanism, that the role of colleges is to instill in young people the intellectual, moral virtues that would supply the country with virtue so we could be a self-governing country. First of all, people have to be self-governing, and they need virtue, all sorts of virtues for that. And the church colleges was to supply that. Well, Rawls just doesn't have any account for those, uh, um, what do I want to say, thick institutions that, pr- that produce virtue, mediating institutions and, uh, that, that produce the virtue. So, it's a, so uh, it's, that's what some of our political arguments are about, right? Uh, how are we going to maintain virtue when we've set free what, what Rusty Reno says, we do moral deregulation everywhere. We deregulate morals. And it's most visible in the sexual revolution, where you deregulate sexual desire. You've set free sexual desire huh, with great negative effects. But how would you deal with that? Rawls, you wouldn't deal, couldn't deal with that from a Rawlsian position at all. That's why it's important for religiously based moral values to be part of the political discussion and political interaction, or you reduce it to a, an unmanageable kind of uh, uh, civilization or culture. <clears throat> okay, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, Colton and then David in the back. So as you just mentioned uh, about using arguments in the political realm um, that are religiously based, I just would like to know what would what does that argument look like? Like, how do you argue from one's religious point of view in the public sphere? What would be an example of that? You mean, how would you argue from religiously based moral values into the public sphere? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of prudence involved with that. Uh, you want to make your argument as widely persuadable, persuasive, widely as persuasive as possible, so you, you, you don't appeal to the Bible, first of all. You don't even appeal directly to the Christian tradition unless you really have to. So you use a language that is more acceptable to a larger group of people, but you do that from religious grounds, and you're quite open about the religious grounds that you're arguing from, but you make the argument as widely persuasive as possible. So in the pro-life movement, uh, you know, there are wonderful biblical verses that you can use, but more... Uh, common arguments uh, persuade more people. So I think you you, uh, try to argue as best possible on the broadest kind of grounds you can, but informed by basic Christian values. And finally, if you're really pressed, you you tell the source and you give chapter and verse. But first of all, you try to to make it as as widely applicable as possible. That that would be my, my way of approaching it. Oh, okay. Last question, David, in the back. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much again. Um, I was wondering, in both the Old and New Testament, there's an obvious concern for Christians to have concern for the poor, marginalized, um, oppressed. Uh, do you see these as political questions as well for Christians? Um, how do you uh, define the relationship between um, maybe policy, speaking into policy, and just sort of the way the church uh, is faithful in these areas? Not sure I got that. Um, uh, 
concern for the poor, is that something that we should argue in a public square as, as Christians? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, conservatives have been very good on hands-on um, charity work uh, and many of our institutions, and I think there's been some empirical evidence that uh, uh, Christians, above all, have uh, care for the poor in a hands-on kind of way. Uh, but it seems to me politically that is a very important uh, set of issues, and it's one that uh, conservative Christians often don't list as a political priority, which I think is a huge mistake, uh, both politically but more, since more, more directly uh, religiously. I'm, I'm on a commission for theology and doctrine of the North American Lutheran Church and have some influence in the kind of issues that we should address. And I think that's precisely one that cannot be, fail for, for Christians in their advocacy, advocacy concerns. So uh, I believe that in the easier cases, we should really be very vocal. In the more difficult cases of how you administer justice, say, to uh, able-bodied people who don't seem to be working, those are much more difficult, and it's very hard to come up uh, with a Christian argument for them. But I think it has to be very clear on the part of the faith group, the 20%, that they care deeply about uh, the marginalized and poor, and not only in their institutions, but politically. And uh, I think that's, that's right up one of the top issues that I think Christians ought to be concerned about.